small change in our agenda today. I'm filling in with a talk um, about the treatment of children with GAMP deficiency and the struggles there and um, where we've found successes with my two children, one who was diagnosed uh, later in life. So this is Samantha. Um, Samantha was born a happy baby. She was healthy. She was chubby. She was thriving. She rolled over early. Um, she was socially very engaged. And as new parents, um, we thought everything was great until she started to fall behind. She walked to 18 months, and that was just good enough, according to the pediatrician, OK. Um, but eventually, at age three, she was diagnosed on the autism spectrum, barely on the autism spectrum by one point, And we were confused. And we, we could tell something was going on in her, in, in her health. And it just it didn't fit well with us. But we charged forward and did a lot of therapies over the next couple of years, worked really hard. Um, Sam made very small gains. She was essentially nonverbal. And at five and a half, she started to have absence seizures. I can look back in pictures and feel horrible and go, oh, she was having them even sooner. I didn't know what these were. Um, so you can see the eye roll was, was a little earlier than we knew that that was happening. Um, and so we quickly, when, we, when she fell after having one of those, we got it to the pediatrician, and he went, ooh, let me get you to neurology, and we got in very quickly. The EEG showed, yeah, you're, this is called an absence seizure. She's having hundreds per day. And let me, let me just do another test and make sure there's not a big tumor. Let's do an MRI. And I had no idea that they also decided at the last minute to add on the spectroscopy which thankfully showed the decrease in creatine. And I was very excited to have an idea of what's wrong. Hey, I can fix it. I can do this. So we're going to give this kid creatine. And you know, we, we had a parent panel yesterday, and one of the dads gave a really nice talk that resonated with me of the emotional journey you go through as a parent of, you know, and it's different with every parent. I don't. I don't want to say I'm speaking on everyone's behalf, but um, what I've observed over the years is it's either it hits you really hard and you kind of got to stop, or you feel really motivated and you jump right in and you're like, I'm going to change the world. So I was going to change the world, and, and she was going to have that creatine she needed. And this is what treatment for us looks like. It's, OK, um, the grams and the this and that and the per kilos of body weight, and it was all new and weird, and make sure you get a scale that's down to at least a tenth of a gram, okay? So it was jump right in, it was Google, and um, we sourced our, our, our supplements from a trusted source, and we started giving them, this makes it look clean and easy. The reality is, for an older kid who loves kid food, all of a sudden you give them some really nasty supplements, you're going to have a fight, especially if they have intellectual developmental issues. And so I can remember about the first five years um, trying everything. Mix it in applesauce. And now I hate applesauce. Don't you dare give me applesauce. Put it in a smooth, like, you know, how do I hide this? So it was um, at about age 10 that I figured out the trick. You like my Diet Coke. You want some Diet Coke? All right. Take a shot of some medicine, and you get the Diet Coke. And she did it. Ooh. And she drank the Diet Coke. Rinse and repeat. And she got on board. And she understood, I'm going to have lunch now. I'm going to do the medicine, then I get this, then I get that. So we worked it out, but honestly, it's very hard. And, and our, our CTD families, a lot of them take supplements as well. And I, from what I hear, they taste even worse. Um, so this is hard. This is a, a real struggle. This is a, an area where we would love a company to compound and make this all taste great and and also not force us to buy products off Amazon and or you know we have supply issues I can't get my sodium benzoate right now and the treatment is not it's not easy and it's not straightforward and our kids really don't like it when they're older so 
Moving on, you've got your creatine. She starts to speak. She's got sentences. Um, she learns to ride a bike. And we work, work, work until public school does not accommodate her well in mainstream. And so I go, well, oh, I'm still fixing you. So we're going to do homeschool. We work on homeschool. And it gets really intense. And it's mom and child. And it's mom going, you're, you're not really disabled. I'm going to fix you. And it's child going, I don't like you anymore. So um, in the peak of that, we go to our regular visit with Dr. Longo. And he gently course corrects us. And, and Sam had a really bad day that day. And he said, she needs role models. She needs to go to school. Get her back in school. And, and you need to do something with your life before you've wasted it. So thankfully, we took that advice immediately. Um, I joined ACD the next month. And, um, and Sam went back to school. And she loves going to school. Um, so what I've learned from Sam is recovering from GAMPT, being diagnosed late, it's not possible. That I, they're earlier is much better, and I think um, we saw in the last slide one case with, uh, with clinical symptoms ended up having normal development, but for the most part, we all have struggles that remain, and, the, and for Sam, seizures remain. So that's, she's, she's not here because we're letting her rest <laughs> and avoid seizures. Um, but my son, Louie, who we call King Louie, um, he was diagnosed thanks to Sam, and here he is taking his creatine, he's thriving, he's got a rich imagination, and the treatment is very different when you start an infant. Like, he did, as a newborn, kind of put his tongue out and resist it a little, but he, he caught on really quickly that the food comes after the medicine, and he, he does great with it. And we just do this concentrated uh, medicine for both the kids, um, so we're really the poster children of how to do it right and, and how important newborn screening is. And I want to mention that um, Dr. Schultze um, generously um, gave uh, us a copy of his poster of the newborn, of the uh, sibling study for GAMPT, comparing these extreme differences. And it's going to be in our poster session. And I can share that information with you. Um, so um, going back really quick to parents and researchers working together, Dr. Longo and Pasquale have been our, not just our advocates, they really led the way um, developing this assay and then partnering with us um, for six and a half years to get GAMPT on the RESP. It was painful, but we did it. And um, in the meanwhile, when I sent Sam back to school, I went to a Utah newborn screening and was like, hey, you, you guys need to hire somebody for anything? I'll sweep the floors. And so I got a job there and worked on their website and then worked in uh, informatics and learned the system inside and now. And, and so we've, we've been at it in newborn screening for quite a while. Um, and this is, this is a little out of date. Like we mentioned, California is actually next month. But we're really excited that um, the rest, being on the RESP has opened a lot of doors, and there's a lot less um, resistance. And, and there's even some laws in different states that they have to align with RESP in a certain amount of time. So we're grateful for that, and we're pushing forward. But um, I also want to go back to CTD and mention, you know, um, Dr. Pasquale talked about those samples she tested. Well, where did she get those samples? They're from our community and families who are saying, yes, you can, you can access my sample, and yes, I'll donate, or hey, would you like a sample now? Like, you, little tiny bits of, of involvement go a long way to support research. Um, so this is, my, this is my little plug to join the registry so that we can pull together a lot of data and have meaningful um, information for researchers, donate to Coriel so that they have lots of different mutations to test and to learn from, and um, on our website, forward slash NBS for newborn screening, there's a little form that you can fill out if you are willing for us to reach out to 
the newborn screening lab where your child was born and find out if your spot is still being kept in a freezer and available for projects like this. So with that, I will invite Dr. Grinspan to come up on the stage and share some information about the trial that was announced um, just a month or two ago. And you can come up, come up here so everyone can hear you really well. Um, thank you, Heidi, and thank you, Sankita, and, and the ACD Foundation for inviting me. Um, uh, I do want to, just before I say any words, um, rare disease parents are some of the fiercest advocates, um, and they all of the work that you see is often driven by the advocacy, by the passion of parents of children with rare diseases. So um, thank you to Heidi, thank you, Sankita, and all of the parents who are here. Um, all the work we do is so inspired by you, and, and particularly this trial, so thank you. Um, so I'm Zach Grinspan, I'm a child neurologist in New York City at Weill Cornell, um, and I'm running a trial of a drug called phenylbutyrate um, for several rare diseases. Um, the the high-level um, uh, thing that links them all is it's children with developmental delay and seizures. Um, uh, the drug phenylbutyrate uh, is an already FDA-approved medicine. Uh, we saw, and I think in one of Dr. Longo's slides, that it, it was FDA-approved for reducing ammonia in children's blood. And then um, a, a handful of researchers also found that um, phenylbutyrate can act as a chemical chaperone, or at least that's what they think is happening. Um, uh, and some of that research is in diseases we started with, STXPP1, SLC6A1, uh, but there is a paper that suggested it may work for SLC6A8, which is creatine transporter deficiency. Um, so we, we have a trial. Uh, we have enrolled one child with SLC6A8 with creatine transporter deficiency. Uh, that child has not received the drug yet. They're, um, uh, I, I'm not supposed to, I've, you know, I've got HIPAA laws, so I, I shouldn't say too much more, but we're, um, uh, we're getting that person. Um, uh, that person will receive the, the medication over the summer. Um, uh, and so my, I think my job today is just to give a high-level overview of what the study is. Um, and if there are families who are interested in enrolling, we do have spots uh, for creatine transporter deficiency. We're interested in children who um, have uh, genetic confirmation of that disorder and who have had at least one seizure in the past month. Um, uh, the study itself um, is... Uh, uh, it's focused on epilepsy and seizures, and so we have a few weeks in which we talk to families, get a sense of what the disease is like, what their journey has been, uh, gather their information about their prior medical history, um, and then uh, the family will either go to New York or to Colorado. We've opened them up as a second site in Denver. Um, uh, the first visit is a three-day, two-night inpatient video EEG admission. Um, uh, and then the drug is started there. You're on the drug for three months, uh, and then you come back for a second admission. Um, that's uh, two days, one night. The drug that we're using, uh, the brand name is Revicti. It's glycerol phenylbutyrate. Um, the story with phenylbutyrate is that when it first came out, it was sodium phenylbutyrate. It's very effective, but it's super gross. It's bitter, it's salty, and, and children have trouble taking it. Glycerol phenylbutyrate, um, uh, uh, avoid several of those problems. The volume is not too bad. It's maybe a teaspoon or less three times a day. And um, it doesn't have that bad taste. And so kids tolerate it quite well. Um, uh, the side effects that we've seen in the study have been that kids get a little bit sleepy. Uh, they can have some suppressed appetite. We did have one child get um, uh, something called metabolic acidosis, where the level of acid in their blood got too high. Um, interestingly, that child disenrolled because of that symptom and then re-enrolled because um, when they got off the drug, the seizures came back. Um, uh, and then the other side effect is that there's a, um, there's a honey-like, sweet, wildflower smell that many of the children get. Um, so. Uh, this is clinical research. There is a lot of uncertainty. We, uh, no child with CTD has yet received the medication, um, and so we're in early days with this. But if anyone has a child uh, with CTD um, who would like to have more information about the study, um, I am here uh, at least uh, through about 3 or three o'clock this afternoon. Um, but uh, Heidi and Sagita, they know where I live. They have my email address, so they can find me. I'm always happy to talk. Um, 
uh, what the uh, what study enrollment looks like is we would schedule a Zoom, um, and I'd be happy to talk about what the study is and, and what's involved. Uh, and then um, if it's interested, we can enroll you either to New York or, um, or Colorado. Um, it's, we, had just, we just have a few spots, and so if you're interested, um, uh, let me know soon so we can make sure that those spots are, are saved. Um, and then I don't know if I should take questions. I'm happy to take questions now. I don't want to uh, disrupt the, there are questions. Okay, we'll start from this table. Okay. Hi, um, I have someone with CTD, he's four and a half, um, and he has a bunch of other comorbidities with CTD. Um, he has prolonged QT syndrome, and he also had a pretty severe hypoglycemic episode. So the decreased um, appetite is worrisome. Um, he's also controlled with seizures, and I think that's one of the maybe exclusion criteria for the study at the time. Um, do you foresee being able to open up this your, like to another cohort for, for people who have, or kids who have more um, controlled seizure activity right now, or do you have thoughts on any of the other comorbidities based on the little information you have? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an awesome question. Heidi, Heidi asked me the same question. So um, I, there's growing enthusiasm in industry based on what we found for the epilepsies. And so there are, um, there are three commercial products that seem to be tolerable to kids. One is, um, or more tolerable than the prior ones. One is Revicti, which is what we've been using. Um, uh, but there's also a, pro and, and I, should, I should be clear about my conflicts. So uh, um, Amgen bought Revicti from Horizon. They have funded my research and are giving me drug, but I don't get any personal compensation from them. So it, it's a little conflict because they're funding my research. Um, so uh, there are two other products other than Revicti. One is Olpruva, which is a powder that you can mix in liquid, doesn't taste too bad. Um, that's approved for kids 20 kilograms and up. And then the other one is Feburane, which are these like granules. And that I think goes down to, um, so both those companies are interested in supporting studies, at least by giving medication. Um, so I think the short, the, the, the short answer is, yes, there is interest. Um, I think the way I'm thinking about the experience we're gonna have with our study, and then there was a child with CTD uh, who received, uh, I think, Revicti at UNC North Carolina. Um, we can think about that as safety data, safety and tolerability data, which will make it easier to do a study in the future. Um, so at, at this moment, there's, there's no open study for children without seizures, but um, we, you know, you have to try it to learn. So, so and it's, this is an FDA approved drug, so we know that it's safe for humans. Um, so we would like to do that. Okay, I have a question. Um, we have a five-year-old boy with CTD um, he has the prolonged QT syndrome as well. How would that med that you're talking about affect him? Um, let's, does he have seizures? Uh, he did, yes. Uh, Seizure-free seizure -free now. So <laughs> I want to be cautious. Um, happy to have a conversation. I think at this point, because the study is designed around seizures, we're, we, we want to be thoughtful about who we enroll. Um, the, I have to remember our exclusion criteria. I mean, long QT I know is in there as a as a potential exclusion, um, but trials evolve, and and uh, because we design this as open label, as exploratory, um, looking at safety and tolerability, I'm happy to have a conversation. Okay, thank you. Two two quick questions. Yeah. So glycerol phenylbutyrate crosses the blood brain barrier. Yes. Uh, there's. Um, uh, non-human non -human primate published data that shows you get a reasonable level in the CSF. And the clinical measure is going to be decreased seizures? Is that what you're looking at with EEG? Yeah, so, so we designed the study around seizures, and that's for like SLC6A1, we've seen some dramatic responders. Um, we've seen responders with STXBP1, with Syngap now, there's some GABA mutations. Um, for CTD, uh, and Heidi and I were talking about this, like, like it seems like MR spectroscopy is probably a, a more relevant biomarker. Um, so it's not part of our protocol now, um, but, but I, you know, I'm thinking, can we do it clinically? Can we have a before and after? So um, I hear you, uh, and, I'm, and it's an active conversation. 
Hi, so I have a son who's 15 going 16 uh, with CTD, presents with seizures, but we live in Canada. Are we eligible? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so the main problem with non-US families is that the inpatient admission we charge to insurance. Um, we had one family who said, no, we'll just pay for it, and the hospital I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. So we typically see that it, like a three-day, two-night overnight admission insurance will pay our hospital about $50,000. Um, the family got a bill for $350,000. So that, that's not what they paid. We, we had a conversation. <laughs> um, but that, that has made it um, just sort of ethically tricky to offer it to non-US folks or people who don't have US-based insurance. Happy to hear that there is a study, and uh, uh, my question is, every patient with every mutation will qualify for this study, or only certain missense variant would be eligible for the study? Um, your, your, quest, it's, your question is spot on. So the letter of the law for the study, we designed to be, you have to have de, monogenetic DEE, monogenetic developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. Um, we had early conversations with the STXBP1 folks about whether we should just limit to a single mutation because some of the preclinical data suggested that. And two things happened. One was um, I went to their meeting and one of the postdocs said, look, we're seeing it, we, we've got true haploinsufficiency and we're seeing a bump in protein effect of wild type protein. And then shortly after, um, we started with STXBP1, a bench neuroscientist came and said, oh, this works for SLC6A1. So our approach has been um, to be open to serendipity, and the study itself is just DEE, and then we're thoughtful and having conversations about who we actually enroll. Um, knowing that this is open label, it's exploratory, it's safety and tolerability, and then once we kind of get a sense of the size of the bucket, then we can go for something more structured with, with a placebo arm, something that's going to be more interesting to regulators. Just a quick announcement. We are into the coffee break, but I'd like to keep this discussion going. So those of you who need coffee, please try to step out quietly and come back. Hi, um, one question on the inclusion also. So if, let's say that if you can make MR, MRS as your primary endpoint for this group, then can, are you, could this be open to non-seizure having kids? It's, it's a perfect question. Um, at this point, we're, we're looking for children who have seizures. Um, but what you've said has been a real theme that I'm hearing from across the CTT world, that the seizures are, are um, uh, they're often controllable with medication. And so um, I think at this point for these first enrollees, we're looking for people with active seizures. Um, but we, but, but I, let me assure you, I hear, I hear the group loud and clear that if this is going to work for this community, seizures are not the best, uh, best endpoint because they seem to be controlled with traditional anti-seizure medicines and that the biochemical endpoints are going to be more relevant. So, but, but to, so at this point, though, um, we're not enrolling children without seizures. Just because I heard uh, like our non-U.S. patients were not eligible right now because of the insurance issue, I'm just wondering if you can open a, another site in Canada. We'll be happy to help you with that. Wonderful. Um, let, let, yeah, let's have a conversation. Um, the... Um, I, there's international interest in the drug, um, uh, and there, the way that it works with Revicti is that um, Horizon, now Amgen, has the rights and, and they distribute it here in the U.S., but there are different companies that distribute it in Europe, as an example. So Emetica is the company that distributes in Europe, and we've been having conversations about them funding a trial for, you know, for regulatory purposes there, so um, happy to talk. Hi, um, can you share what your primary endpoint is or your secondaries? 
So the, the primary endpoint is safety and tolerability. Um, uh, and so from that, it's like a whopping success. Um, the kids lap it up. They don't, it doesn't seem to bother them. Um, the appetite suppression and sleepiness uh, are well managed with, um, uh, uh, well managed with um, either lowering the dose temporarily or, or not getting up to our goal dose. Some kids, we get to the goal dose, they have the side effects, we back off, the side effects go away, and then we gradually go up again, and, and, they, um, and they, they don't get the side effects. And then in the rare cases, or in the handful of cases where we've had a more substantial metabolic acidosis, we're neurologists, we use ketogenic diet all the time, and so acidosis is our bread and butter, and so we give them some baking soda, some citrate, um, uh, and they do okay. The, but, the, but that's not the clinical out, out points. Um, we have a, a list of clinical endpoints that are in exploratory as, as per the study design. Seizures are the big one. We do EEG before and after, and so we're looking at EEG biomarkers. We get a Bailey's, we get a Vineland, which are looking measures of neurodevelopment. Um, we do ORCA, which is a measure of communication. Um, we have a quality of life metric. Um, and I, oh, sleep. So we heard that a lot from our DEE kids, so we have a sleep measure that's in there. Um, uh, I think, and there may be one or two more surveys. Um, so those are, those are intended to be exploratory because we, we're not sure which needles are going to move and what the effect size is going to be. Just a quick question I think it might be helpful for oh, uh, our community, <laughs> yeah. our patient community. Yeah. Um, like 60 second, can you describe the perfect pathway of a repurposed drug going into this type of a trial, yeah. then becoming available to have your local geneticist or pharmacist fill a script and your insurance cover it? What are our hurdles? What does that look like? If this, if this were the perfect drug, which... Yeah, it would be cheaper. <laughs> um, uh, Heidi, I love that question because I, I actually don't know the answer of what that perfect path is. Um, I think the perfect drug would be one that was inexpensive. You get some experience, it looks like it works, and you just give it to the kid. So if we were doing trials with aspirin and it works, like Groovy, just give it to everybody. Phenylbutyrate in the U.S. is $800,000 a year, the, the, the glycerol phenylbutyrate. Um, and so our regulatory pathway that we're imagining looks like this. Um, we. Uh, we publish what we've found, which, which has some very strong preliminary data um, and, and open label data, and then we have conversations with um, four organizations called Drug Compendia. Um, these are organizations that list in these sort of official um, uh, uh, you know, books and websites what are acceptable on-label and off-label uses for medications. And we know that insurers pay attention to those compendia. And many insurers will pay for things, even if it's not on the label, if a compendia says that it's a, an acceptable off-label use. Um, so we've, we tried just to write Revicti for some kids, and, and um, it, was, it was either, I think it was a Medicare payer wrote back to us and specifically said, we looked at the compendia and we don't see this, so nice try, you know, play again later. Um, so that's, that's our pathway here for this expensive drug. I think for less expensive off-label drugs, um, it may be easier. Um, you know, I'm working with a rare disease group where like, there's, there's some old tricyclic antidepressants that, that maybe have an effect, and like, you just write for it. Nobody's going to give you trouble. A quick question. Um, SLC6A1 is uh, a deficit of um, glucose uh, syndrome. So when you will give this drug to CTD patient, do you expect uh, to regulate uh, brain glucose metabolism, for example, and by which mechanism? Um, great question. Um, l let me clarify it. So there's, um, there's GLUT1 deficiency. Um, which is a different disorder. Um, SLC6A1 is, um, is a, it's a mutation in the GAT1 transporter, which is a GABA, like a GABA reuptake, in, a GABA reuptake channel. Um, uh, and so those, those are children who have normal glucose, normal CSF glucose, 
Um, they present with refract with some developmental delay um, and often seizures in kind of early childhood, often with absent seizures, like I'm hearing from the CTD um, community. Um, and in those kids, the response is often dramatic. They, there's an EEG biomarker that we're seeing clean up. Um, and you know, my one family, I call them the respondingest responder. Um, he was having 30 brief seizures an hour in his first EEG, and he's now seizure-free for two or three years. So, so we've been very encouraged by these anecdotes, um, uh, and it was, um, uh, it was based on that success that we sort of looked around to see, well, who else has been thinking about this? And then we found that 2018, 2019 paper suggesting it may be helpful for CTD. Did, that, did I answer your question? I, I hope that was, okay. So uh, right here, um, I'm Matt Skelton from Cincinnati Children's. Um, we should definitely talk later. Yes. Um, but I had a question about, are you going to do any sort of pharmacogenomics with these patients to see if the type of mutation influences the outcome? So patients that maybe have a point mutation versus a stop or something like that, if there's, you would almost predict a better outcome with patients with the point mutations. Yeah, um, so your instincts are spot on, and if, if I could just clear up a few months, I would write that grant. <laughs> um, I, so um, early instincts when we started was exactly that, like, well, maybe this is only going to work for the missense, and we should, like, not enroll the truncations, not enroll the ones that are truly haploinsufficient. Um, we... Uh, we opted to ignore that instinct um, uh, successfully because what we're seeing in the trial is that um, genotype doesn't seem to predict, and I have to be very cautious because I, I have to do a more formal analysis, but like, like a lot of kids seem to do well and it doesn't seem to matter what their mutation is. Um, uh, it seems more to be related to the clinical phenotype, um, and the only thing that we're seeing is that children who have uh, epileptic spasms, infantile spasms, and have that like forest fire, um, uh, hips arrhythmic EEG, it doesn't do anything for them. So we, we seem to have some instinct of who it's not working for. Um, but with the rest, um, we're often seeing hits when you might not have guessed it from the, the gene. You know, so I don't really know how this is working. Like, did we just find a better seizure drug? Like, that's possible. Or is this something that's really working at, at this molecular level um, uh, and, and maybe working through some mechanisms that are, um, that are not obvious? Great. Oh, there's one question one here. One question I'm here. I'm taking up too much time. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. So in terms of the, the cost, you mentioned the cost of the glycerol formulation. Is there a significant increase in cost for the glycerol variety versus the sodium? Um, and is that yeah, kind of like a, an order of magnitude. Um, my sense is that the this you know, and again, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but my sense is that insurers like, you know, a few tens of thousands of dollars. They often look the other way, um, and and those kinds of drugs seem to be easier to write off label if you can write a good justification. Um, uh, but when you have a drug that's close to a million dollars a year, they pay attention. Um, so I think. The glycerol is substantially more expensive, and, and you know, I, I, Dr. Longo, I, you know, molecular MD geneticists deal with the urea cycle disorders all the time, where there's high ammonia, um, and and seem to get for those diseases insurance to pay for the revicti when the when the sodium formulations fail. Um, but those are very specialized circumstances, and and in this off-label setting for the very expensive drug, it's harder. Great. Um, Dr. Grinspan is going to be here through lunch, so um, if you have additional questions for him, uh, please do find him at that time and um, continue the discussion. Uh, we'll just take a minute's break okay. while I set up Thank an additional you. chair. <laughs> nice Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Grinspan. <laughs> <laughs>